This coin pod is sponsored by America's Card Room, an online gaming service that supports over 60 different cryptocurrencies. Coin pod listeners who create an account with America's Card Room can use the code BTC100, that's BTC100, to redeem a bonus of 100% of the initial amount you deposit to your Card Room account. For more information, visit americascardroom.com and start playing today. Thanks for listening to episode four of The Coin Pod, a podcast of conversations about Bitcoin with people around the world who use, build, and study Bitcoin. I'm your host, Zach Full. Today's guest is a prominent spokesperson, not just for Bitcoin, but for a specific subculture within Bitcoin that grows larger and more noticeable as time passes. Paul Krugman has called it a cult. Zero Hedge reported studies that called it fuel for toxic masculinity and health blog Naturally Strong calls it a bizarre phenomenon questioning if it could actually kill Bitcoin users. I'm talking about crypto carnivory, the emergent pairing of hardcore Bitcoin hodling with zero-carb carnivorous dieting. My guest today is Michael Goldstein, president of the Nakamoto Institute and co-host of the noted Bitcoin podcast. Bitstein told Inc.com, quote, Bitcoin carnivore bodybuilders shall inherit the galaxy, end quote. And today he explains why. Listen and learn from him as he shares the reasons why so many Bitcoiners are choosing a lifestyle of meat and Bitcoin maximalism. Here's Bitstein. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Michael. It's a pleasure having you here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, before we jump into stuff about uh, Bitcoin maximalism and meat maximalism, could you give us, um, I'm sure you've given this a thousand times, but could you tell us when you first came across Bitcoin? Um, I guess it's quite a, a decent time ago now. Um, when it first came on your radar and how it peaked and held your interest? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it actually it's kind of crazy to think how long ago it was now. Um, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011 from uh, Daniel Prowitz, uh, who had messaged me one day and told me that he found a great new investment opportunity. Uh, I downloaded Bitcoin. Uh, I got really bored because my balance just stayed at zero and nothing was happening. And I uninstalled it. Mostly forgot about it, but kind of watched the... Uh, Watched the spike to thirty dollars and then the the collapse into pennies or less than pennies, uh, less than a dollar. I mean, um, and then I kind of forgot about it for a year. And uh, at the end of twenty twelve, that's when I really got into Bitcoin. Uh, Cody Wilson of Defense Distributed came to the Libertarian Longhorns, which was our uh, Libertarian group at the University of Texas, and he gave a whole talk about three D printed guns. Uh, which we were all into at the time. That was before they had even made anything. And uh, he he made it all click by telling us about the crypto anarchists and the cypherpunks. He read uh, Tim May's Cypherpunk Manifesto to us. Uh, and uh, he also he also just made this simple comparison of, you know, just like now he was explaining how we were going to be able to send guns through the internet, physical objects through the internet. He analogized it to uh, sending gold through the internet a la Bitcoin. And uh, in that moment, it made sense as this, you know, actual thing. Um, and we we spent time just kind of, you know, sorting out the economics, like, you know, realizing it's actually scarce and not just a, a fiat money. And uh, from there, at the we had the Mises Circle at UT, and we we uh, dove into the economics uh, every week. And uh, yeah, we we became extremely obsessed, and uh, you see the the fruits of that today. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I, so I'm curious how, given all of that, I'm, a lot of people are um, n- now, especially nowadays, uh, but back when I got into it, um, are attracted to Bitcoin through the price. Um, and then from the price, they are sort of, it's sort of a gateway to a whole bunch of other coins and tokens and all of that other nonsense. Um, but you're a hardline maximalist. Um, why and how did you adopt that position? Um, well, so I mean, to go back when, when we were, you know, getting into it, 
you know, to this extreme. So it was, you know, this was around uh, October and November of uh, 2012. So Bitcoin was about ten dollars. Um, and I actually distinctly remember being with uh, my friends uh, from the Mises Circle uh, at a pizza place uh, by University of Texas just right after one of the meetings. And someone got out their phone and announced to the group that uh, Bitcoin had hit $20. And all of us stood up and started high-fiving one another. Uh, and it was like, it was the greatest moment of all time. Uh, so we've, we've come a long way since then. Uh, but back then, you know, altcoins were not really a thing. Uh, the, the, the first sort of major one uh, was Litecoin. And that came, that, that kind of hit the scene I, as if I can remember correctly, it was somewhere around like April 2013. So it was already after we had established that Bitcoin is the sound money and it's basically the greatest thing to ever exist. Uh, and then this thing Litecoin shows up and it just it just seemed like a knockoff to us. You know, we could just you just sense it in our bones. And, you know, after we we thought carefully about it and the different arguments being made for it, um, things like, oh, well, it uses a different. Uh, uh, a different hashing algorithm. It was using script instead of, uh, you know, SHA-256, of course. And, uh, oh, it has it has four times the quantity and uh, it has faster confirmations. We kind of, you know, picked through these. Daniel had written a great article back then after, uh, I think that and I guess PP Coin had also come out at the time, uh, uh, around then. I don't remember what they they changed the name to. Uh, a pure coin, pure coin is what it what it changed to because they realized that PP coin was not the uh, the the best of names. But he wrote a great article called the the problem with altcoins, um, and that kind of you know solidified the the thought process that we had. And uh, so so we kind of we established that position sort of at the beginning of this this altcoin thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, as, as things went on, the 2013 happened, and I, I've called it for years now the the Scambrian explosion uh, of altcoins, and we just saw more and more uh, coming out, and they were all just knockoffs of knockoffs of knockoffs. Um, for everything that Litecoin was to Bitcoin, there was Feathercoin to Litecoin, uh, you know, even faster confirmations and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, we, we just saw this this whole history play out and, and nothing was delivering on our terms, which, you know, as I was explaining, you know, the reason that we got into this thing in the first place had nothing to do with the technology per se. The technology was a means by which to enact this economic uh, system, uh, in, you know, put it put it into reality. And so you know, just kind of throwing goofy features at us and putting up a, a Bitcoin talk announcement page uh, really didn't mean much. What meant what meant something to us was the network effect. Uh, and Bitcoin has had that network effect. And I think we'll continue to have that network effect, despite this entire history of people trying to scam it out of existence. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think let's say for example that you first got into bitcoin uh at the beginning of 2017 or maybe even like this august when it rocketed past three or four thousand dollars or whatever it was um do you think you would slowly adopt the same position you have now given that back when it was five ten fifteen dollars you saw gradually all of these coins develop and thought all right well this is just crap these are knockoff scams what have you but if you entered it with an array of thousands of coins already there, do you think you would have picked through all of them and eventually decided Bitcoin is the singular winner? Um, you know, that's actually a very good question. I think I think it would be a lot more difficult to come to that conclusion today, although that doesn't dissuade me uh, from my position. Uh, you know, when when Bitcoin when we got into Bitcoin, uh, I still have up on our old Mises Circle website uh, a page I called, you know, a Bitcoin reader. And it was my attempt at collecting resources on Bitcoin so that people who were coming to a, a meeting we were doing where we were discussing the economics of Bitcoin could learn about it. And it was incredibly difficult to find any resources beyond the Bitcoin talk forum, uh, the Bitcoin wiki, Bitcoin.org. 
Uh, I think we used coins. Uh, it was around then, so there was that that cool little video they had made, uh, and a handful of news articles and one or two good ac- academic papers. Um, and uh, so it was very difficult to find things. And we live in a situation today where it's easier than ever to find good information. You can just go to Jameson Lopp's, you know, Bitcoin resource page, and there's there's everything you you could need. Uh, but there's also with that, there's endless information out there, you know, going on about blockchain technology and and smart contracts and all of these sort of uh, uh, distractions um, and and you know various various kinds of either um, you know things that are actually orthogonal to Bitcoin. So a lot of the a lot of the quote unquote blockchain things people are working on don't actually compete with Bitcoin. It's a totally different thing and they're just kind of latching onto the words um then there's you know the outright scams and all this point being that people coming into the space now have a lot more that they have to parse through so i think me specifically i think if i you know had only heard about bitcoin uh at the beginning of 2017 um had i had the same education that i had prior to when i learned about bitcoin in 2012 that is all of the all of the austrian economics i read and uh stuff like that i think i would be able to still come to understand this position because i i'd come to bitcoin knowing that the purpose of bitcoin is to act as a sort of gold 2.0 um and i i would be able to, to sort of frame everything uh that way uh, but if someone is coming in 2017 with the idea that it's just a payment network or um, it's some kind of, you know, weird tech platform or something like that, I think it's much more difficult uh, today, um, which is why it's it's very important to sort of, uh, you know, seek smart people out and, and learn from them. And, yeah, of course, actually confront all of the, the opinions and, and see what you see which what conclusions you can come to because you know there is always the possibility that i'm wrong sure sure no i i um, agree it's it's sort of an interesting conundrum where it's simultaneously easy to find as much information as you want like you mentioned jameson's page but also there's an overabundance of just nonsense that it makes it more difficult to find that information or process it if you're completely new to everything so it can be a little overwhelming I want to pivot uh, quickly uh, from Bitcoin. You're also a meat uh, maximalist um, and part of a a small but quickly growing sort of Bitcoin subculture, I guess, of uh, Bitcoin and meat maximalists. Um, can you sort of tell us how that came on your radar or where uh, this sort of um, dietetic interest uh, came from? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, yeah. The army, the army of Bitcoin carnivores grows, um, and it grows daily. And uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm amazed, and I'm, I'm humbled by the kind of messages I get from people just telling me that uh, they've started eating this way, and they've, they've had a lot of great success. Um, so I'm really happy to kind of, you know, be able to, you know, to, to help, you know, mean people into to new ideas that really changes how they, how they look at the world for the positive. Um, I guess I, I, this sort of start story starts, uh, only a little bit, uh, before the Bitcoin story. Uh, I, I learned about paleo, paleo diets back in 2011, uh, probably closer to the beginning of 2011. Um, I, I had a friend in college who was, uh, who I, I, I learned, uh, in the past had been a, a very large and very sick guy, um, which by looking at him, I could not have possibly known that. And turns out why he was, he was eating a, a very, you know, high fat animal rich, you know, meat rich, uh, paleo diet. Um, and through that he had lost, you know, 130 pounds and overcome a lot of, a lot of health issues. So that kind of opened me up and opened me up to the, the evolutionary, uh, way of looking at nutrition and, you know, I, I grew up eating just, you know, living off fast food um, and nothing about nutrition really ever made sense to me or uh, seemed like anything but some kind of weird scam. Um, but I, until until I learned about this in which in this way of this way of framing 
uh, nutrition from an evolutionary perspective, which evolution was something that I, I had, you know, studied quite a bit in high school um, and had a, had a deep appreciation for. So it finally caught my interest and, and got me into nutrition. And uh, I was in, into that for a very long time. Um, and then in 2014, uh, a friend of mine had come across a talk by Zuko um, of Zcash uh, about uh, ketogenic diets. Um, and that, despite all of my, my time trying to get him to go paleo to lose some weight, it was, it was a five-minute talk by, by Zuko on ketogenic diets that really won him over. And that opened my eyes to uh, looking at it not th- just through evolution per se of like, you know, don't, don't eat foods that, you know, didn't exist for large periods of man's formative evolutionary years. Uh, but also looking, you know, at the specific, you know, metabolic uh, effects of, of various foods that uh, you might be eating um, and sort of the, the differences between a, a ketogenic and a glycolytic metabolism. So and, and with that, that one of the first resources that I read was uh, by Amber O'Hearn, who's Zuko's ex-wife. And she had a whole blog. Uh, she has two blogs, ketotic.org and empirica where it's dot ca um and she was writing about how she was a carnivore so her introduction to ketogenic diets was well spend 30 days just eating meat uh because it's it's sort of easiest because you don't have to count anything because you're certainly not going to reach some level of carbs uh eating meat and uh this just set me off on on a big rabbit hole um and uh, although I I, I kind of put the all meat behind me, I, I it just kind of stayed in the back of my mind as a thing that's possible, uh, but not necessarily something that I was interested in. And I don't remember what why it caught my eye again, but about a year later, um, I I sort of revisited that when I was I was doing more keto research, and this led me down the path of. Of reading, you know, uh, Wilhelmer Stephenson, who is an Arctic explorer who uh, lived with the Inuit, Inuit for a decade and and talked about eating only meat. Uh, he came back and did a year long study at Bellevue where they just watched every single thing he ate, um, just to prove that he'd be healthy on an all meat diet. And after a year, he was totally fine. Uh, it also opened me up to uh, some old forum posts and essays by Owsley Stanley, the famous uh, LSD manufacturer and Grateful Dead sound guy, who it turns out had started uh, being a carnivore about the time, the same age. This is when I was 23. It's he started when he was 23, and he did that for you know a good 50 years of his life until he died in a car crash, and he just had forum posts where he was just going, you know, answering every question under the sun. And uh, uh, I also read the the work of uh, a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston Price, which I, I rank among uh, one of the most important of the 20th century, where he, he traveled the world and looked at compared the uh, dental health, but also, you know, general health of uh, people eating traditional diets versus their their modern counterparts, you know, with a lot of refined sugars and such. And every every place he went, the traditional people were much healthier. And uh, it was especially interesting to note that it was the groups like the Inuit that he uh, said were among the healthiest. So I went down that rabbit hole and at, at some point I decided to give it a try and uh, I haven't looked back since. That's fascinating. I uh, I won't lie. Well, I guess I should mention um, before I ask a couple questions about the diet, you sort of rattled off a whole bunch of resources. And from what I understand, you curate a pretty exhaustive list of those and other similar resources. Um, can you tell our listeners where they can find that and any other additional resources you might think would be helpful for someone who's curious about a ketogenic or, I guess, carnivorous diet? Uh, yeah. I So I have a website. I, I just threw it up as a, as a way to you know put these resources out there in, in one place. Um, and people can go to justmeat.co. Uh, it's just a it's just a big old list of of random links they can they can uh, search through. One of the weird things about this is you know as as many people have caught on, there's not a lot of science, uh, which throws people off. And uh, what I mean by not a lot of science, I 
I actually do think there's a lot of science, but it comes in a form that people aren't used to, which is a lot of, you know, sort of anecdotal evidence and uh, lines of evidence through, you know, anthropology and evolution and stuff like that. Um, but as far as journal articles, it's very difficult to find a journal article that, you know, talks about a controlled study with meat. In fact, I besides uh the one of Stephenson and his year long meat trial i i don't know of really any scientific article that has explored it and so you know on on the one hand that perhaps might give you reason to uh think that there's nothing to it but on the other hand it also means that no one has actually falsified it uh and so when you see when you see a lot of people succeeding the way they are it gives a uh, a lot of a lot of reason to suggest that it's great. Uh, although I should say there's there's a lot of clinical evidence um, and stuff like that that is that is more scientific. Sure, um, I I won't lie though. When I think of an all meat diet, it sounds a little bit um, boring from sort of a culinary perspective. Um, and I guess on that note, I have two questions. Can you sort of tell us how you keep variety or how one would keep variety in an all meat diet? Because um, I think of it as sort of, well, I don't want to eat steak for three meals a day or something like that, steak or chicken or what have you. Um, and uh, are are eggs allowed in an all meat diet um, or or not? Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. Can you answer those? Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, my, my personal diet is not really varied at all. I, I mostly just eat steaks, mostly ribeyes, T-bones, and New York strip steaks, uh, and plenty of ground beef as well. As far as it being boring, I think uh, the kind of people who think that steak gets boring are the kind of people who have not eaten steak for every meal. Because what you find is, is you know, one of the one of the very common things you hear from people who go carnivorous is that they, they lose their cravings. And uh, I, I've definitely had that myself. So, like, you know, it doesn't even cross my mind that I'm missing out on something. As far as variety goes, uh, you know, I, I do eat a lot of stuff if it's around. I, you know, I had some salmon last night because uh, it was around. Um, I'll eat eggs if they're around. I'll eat bacon if it's around. I'll eat a lot of different things if it's around. Um, a, a lot of the names, you know, that we call these diets are kind of slightly misleading so when you say all meat people think that it's literally only steak um which does make up a large portion of what most people eat um but really the the sort of key thing is just um you know uh you know why it's carnivorous is because it's eating from the animal kingdom so you know uh, eggs are from the animal kingdom you can have at it and the the amount of carbohydrates in it is is minimal um so the yeah the there another term that it goes by is zero carb and people get confused by that because they think you know plants tend you know there's there's certain vegetables and stuff that have you know effectively very very close to to zero carbohydrates that you you know absorb from them so people think that counts and it's, uh it's a little misleading but um yeah i mean as variety goes there's there's a lot of animals and a lot of animal parts so uh, the important thing is just to, you know, eat, eat the meat you can afford. Sure, sure. Um, eating the meat you can afford is a perfect segue into a couple other questions I had on the diet. Um, an all meat diet for just your average person who, uh, especially your average American who eats a lot of uh, processed foods, objectively unhealthy foods, um, even maybe not necessarily fast food, but just even store bought food, um, incredibly unhealthy a zero carb carnivorous all meat diet whatever label you want to put on it um could seem and, and realistically could be very expensive um for someone to uh to try or stay on um and so i'm curious to hear your thoughts on how sort of one could go about feasibly sticking to an all meat diet given bu certain budget constraints maybe but also how you would go about um sticking to uh the healthiest meat you could possibly get, given that there are so many sort of stimulants and toxins and other chemicals circulating in our food supply all over the place. Um, can you speak to those issues at all? Uh, yeah. So there's a lot, a lot to parse through there. Um, so is first cost. Uh, actually, first of all, I, I think we should, uh, you know, re refrain from uh, degrading the good name of fast food too much because 
yes, while most things at McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever, uh, I would not recommend anyone get near their bodies whatsoever. Uh, these places are incredibly awesome, you know, sources of, of cheap, nutritious beef. Um, and you can go anywhere in the country and you'll find burger patties for a dollar um, that fill you up and uh, keep you healthy and strong. So um, I actually love fast food more than most restaurants. Um, uh, as far as uh, budget, so, I mean, depending on how constrained someone is, if they're living off ramen and stuff, uh, you can go pretty hardcore. You can get, you know, $2 pound ground beef at Walmart, you know, in the form of frozen burger patties. And, you know, it's not the greatest thing, but it'll it'll keep you full and satisfied. Otherwise, you know, uh, a lot of butchers will sell the sort of off cuts and trimmings for, for really cheap. And those will actually tend to be really fixable for some reason don't want the fat. Um, so that's an option. You can buy in bulk at, at Costco to save some money. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, to keep the prices down. Um, you just kind of have to, if, if budget is a problem, you just need to, you know, uh, do a little more research and look for good deals. The other thing, though, is that, uh, you know, the way that a lot of people eat, you know, they, they think about the cost just because, you know, they, they see the cost of a single steak and they think that's really expensive because it's, you know, $7 a pound or, or more, um, you know, for some. But what they don't think about is all of the costs that add up from all of the eating out, all of the, uh, you know, all of the junk that goes to waste. Um you know, all, all, all these extra things uh, that people end up buying. I, I used to, you know, back when I ate vegetables, I would have, I, I'd buy a lot of broccoli and stuff like that. And a bunch of it would go bad and go in the trash. And um, on this diet, there's less food waste. I spend less time even going to the grocery store, even thinking about it. So, you know, if time is money, then you're saving a lot of money in that way. Um, so when you look at the cost holistically, I really don't think that it's, uh, that much more expensive. Just uh, you know, if if things are are an issue, just like I said, there's there's a lot of deals out there. You just kind of have to go hunting for it. And you know, we we can't go hunt bison as much, but we can hunt deals. So I can't disagree with that. Um, but I I do see and know that people disagree with sort of the the premise and tenets of the diet as a whole. Do you have any um, particular objections? that you you get thrown at you that are uh, your favorite or I guess maybe most annoying to respond to or something by people who are vegetarians or vegans or just general omnivores, that sort of thing? Yeah, well, of course. Actually, I mean, going back, I realized there was a whole bit of your question that we didn't address, which was the, the health of the meat itself. Um, generally speaking, I think a lot of the stuff with uh, meat is overblown. Um uh, the, the numbers I've seen have suggested that, you know, if you, if you don't want hormones in your food, beef is the best food to have because everything else has even more. You know, think of all the soy that's in, in foods and that that's a major uh, endocrine disruptor as a, uh, you know, xenoestrogen, stuff like that. Um, and there's, there are regulations in this country around it. And, you know, I, I'm not one to speak highly of government, but, you know, I... I tend to not, I, I, I don't worry about American beef. Um, but any, anyway, to get to your, your question about uh, how, uh, you know, best arguments and stuff like that. Uh, of course, you know, people tend to have just sort of the dogma of, you know, fat will kill you. Um, and that's, that's always fun, I guess. But it's, it's you know, like beating a dead horse. Uh, with all meat, I mean, I think that the most interesting thing about it to me is just the fact that, you know, like we were talking about it um, with the science. So people think that because there isn't a bunch of journal articles that meat is like an all meat diet is crazy or not good for you or, you know, whatever. And uh, all personal experience and the personal experiences of everyone I see counteracts that. And so as someone who's, you know, very interested in science, we have to take this evidence into consideration. So if I have a belief that, uh, you know, eating only meat would be really bad, but then I see a lot of people eating only meat and have been for 
years, if not you know decades or more, and doing great, uh, I have to update my priors. And a lot of people seem to have a lot of difficulty with that. They they consider continue to just say that it's purely unscientific. Um, it, it always reminds me of what Nassim Taleb talks about with you know uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And likewise, you know, uh, absence of good scientific journal articles uh, peer reviewed about all meat doesn't mean that uh, peer-reviewed journal articles about all meat can't exist. It's just that people have been stuck in a certain inertia and momentum with the nutrition science, which has been, you know, fully warped for decades now, thanks to the, you know, uh, sugar industry and and all sorts of weird political for- forces. Um, you know. People could be studying this, and they just aren't. Um, so, actually, I think it's I think it's completely unscientific to uh, just offhandedly just you know say that it's unscientific uh, because we can see the actual uh, evidence of people's real experience, and we do have to take that con- into consideration. Even if we, in the end, find out that these people are a fluke, or you know, they'll die tomorrow. In fact, do you think? Um some of the comments you just made there uh, remind me, or at least in, in in the way the criticisms are presented are very similar to how people criticize Bitcoin, um, which is sort of offhanded, unintelligent um, dismissal remarks. Um, do you see the uh, carnivory and uh, Bitcoin maximalism as just coincidentally paired together by an increasing amount of people in the space? Or do you see them as sort of like fundamentally connected in any number of ways? I don't know. I'd love to believe that there's, there's you know, deep forces uh, of, of mimetic power going on here that, that truly bind them together. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right that I, I do think a lot of the sort of offhanded remarks against them each are... <laughs> Are, are very, very similar. I'm actually, I have on my wall uh, a printout of the tweet that Paul Krugman tweeted where he quoted me, uh, where I, I had said in a Vice article that Bitcoin is a revolt against fiat money and an all-meat diet is a revolt against fiat food. And Paul Krugman said, when I said it's a cult, I understated things. And he was meaning Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, you know, Paul Krugman is the type of person he, he fundamentally can't understand, uh, you know, why, why Bitcoin is a good thing. And likewise, he seems to, you know, fundamentally be unable to understand why, you know, perhaps all meat diets are something that we should be investigating. Well, we are sort of coming up on the time limit here for this episode. Uh, Michael, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. This has been a, a blast of a conversation. Um, I guess I, I want to close with one final question uh, for me personally and any other listeners who might be considering joining me starting the 30 day trial only meat um, diet. Can you sort of give any uh, preliminary simple advice and maybe recommend one or two resources from your site that we should read while we eat our steaks? Oh, well, yeah, there's there's nothing I could say that would be better than what was already written. Um, I highly recommend everyone go read an article by Amber O'Hearn. Uh, it's on it's on justmeat.co and it's called Eat Meat Mostly Fast Fat Not Too Little. Um and she gives the rundown of you know why you might consider doing this, what kind of food you can be eating, um, what kind of pitfalls uh there will be, what kind of adaptation stuff to expect. She she goes over the whole thing, and I think it's uh, a must read for anyone who's uh who's interested. Otherwise, I think it's just important to, you know, be open to the idea that plants might actually be less beneficial and, in fact, sometimes even actively harmful. Um, And that can kind of, you know, just open your mind enough and and get you excited about trying something new. Um, I'd also recommend checking out N equals many, which is Sean Baker's uh, study. He has a there's a website connected to it. I think it's called Trackwell. Um, so it's n equals many dot com, and there should be links to that. And uh, what's nice about that is, uh, if you're just getting into it, you can you can you can do the trial, and you can input your data, so you can kind of keep track of you know how things are changing and 
what that will also do is as you're making that data, you're giving more data to the community so that we can say, hey, look, this person did really well on on zero carb. Look at these numbers. Um, and it kind of helps do community based science. Um, or, you know, if you if uh, if it doesn't work out so well, we'll get those numbers, too. And those those are also very important for the uh, scientific uh you know, process. Uh, although I, I do tend to, to expect uh, you to do very well. I, again, can't thank you enough. This has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for me. I'd, I'd love to come back on some time, talk, talk more Bitcoin, talk more meat, anything you want. Absolutely. We'll have to do this again sometime for sure. In the meantime, our listeners can follow Michael on Twitter at Bitstein. And can view the resources we've mentioned today and many more at justmeet.co. This coin pod has been a production of You, Me, and BTC, your Bitcoin and Liberty Network. Special thanks to my colleagues, Tim Baker and Daniel Brown, as well as my guest, Michael Goldstein. Be sure to follow the coin pod on Twitter at the coin pod and visit thecoinpod.com to learn more about the show. Message me with any questions and comments you may have after each episode. And join the weekly post-podcast recap on TokenDaily.com as well. We'll be back next week with another episode of The Coin Pod. Until then, cheers. Cheers.